Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. I'm, I guess there's a few people coming in late, but since we're already also streaming the uh, event today, I thought it would be better to start on time. Um, yeah, welcome, everyone. Um, I guess most of you are part of the Lectures for Future courses, either at Angewandte or TU. Is there anyone who's not part of the Lectures for Future course? Please raise your hand. Okay. Two people? Okay, I, I'll just say a few words anyways. Um, so this is a lecture series that uh, is taking place at several universities in Austria, two of them being uh, TU Wien and Angewandte, where we just try to raise awareness and get into discussion with people about global challenges and the climate crisis from very interdisciplinary broad perspectives. And I'm very glad today that actually this is the first time in two, three, three years that we've managed to combine two courses, the one at TU and at Angewandte, so that actually uh, the students are coming together as well. Um, so also welcome to, to all the TU students who are probably here in the building for the first time. Um, and to my colleagues, Christian Peer and Wada Durigo, who are sitting here in the first row with me, uh, teaching the course at Angewandte, and my colleague, Carlos Toledo, um, who's teaching the course uh, at Angewandte with me. Um, Enough about the lectures for future themselves, though. Uh, today we want to discuss climate social politics, uh, klima soziale politik. So the panel will be based on the book that I'm sure um, we will hear more about. Um, the panel will be uh, presented. Yeah, there is a book. <laughs> the panel will be presented by um, the moderator, and I have the honor of um, presenting her or uh, introducing her. So. Welcome, Christina Planck. Um, Christina is a political scientist working at BOKU at the Institute of Development Research. Um, and she's also part of the Beigewum, um, an associ association of uh, critical social scientists, who are also one of the organizations that um, are publishing or that published or edited uh, the book that uh, we're going to hear more about. And that's all from my side. Very welcome, and uh, I hand the word over to Christina. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, thank you for inviting us, for having us at this lecture for future today. Um, and welcome to this panel discussion with the title Riches, Res Resistance and Provisioning How to Shape a Climate Social Society. So we are happy that we can discuss several very important questions with you today, which are also tackled in this book. I already showed a cover to you and um, making this <laughs> announcement that in the back, um, you can also have a look at it or even buy it if you want to. There is a stall um, with Annalena. Yeah, so you're welcome to look at this and also at the Kurswechsel, which is the journal, journal um, that uh, the Beige Room also um, edits. So we, the panelists today, are um, Iris Frey, Katharina Litschauer, Mario Tascher, and my name is Christina Planck. And we are going to discuss some important elements of what we call climate social politics. So what is climate social politics about? When social dimensions are brought into a climate crisis discussion today, they are often um, framed as being contradictive, like to solve the climate crisis. And that's what we are kind of arguing like against it. Um, because often, for example, there are arguments that you can find um, in the discussion that um, an effective um, reduction of emissions, um, for example, via shutting down coal-fired power plants, plants might increase fuel poverty or like the, the conversion of the automotive industry when you think about um, what is going on in Upper Austria, for example, this might lead to higher uh, rates of unemployment. And of course, this is partly true, but what we want to um, invite you is to get a different perspective on those topics, how you can combine the social and the ecological dimension to create what we call then um, just an emission-free society. And this has been, has been spelled out in the book that we um, edited together 
with a pack and um, another organization, uh, namely the Austrian Anti-Poverty Network. So what we're going to discuss today is basically based on, let's say, three broader questions. So on the one hand, we're interested in um, the challenges and also but the contributions of civil society um, that it faces when it um, contributes to the shaping of a climate social society. Um, another question we're going to discuss is what role wealth plays for an effective uh, climate politics. And then we want to narrow this topic down, like coming from the climate, yeah, more conventional, maybe first of all, uh, climate politics perspective towards the perspective of social inequality to a concrete example, which we thought might especially be interesting for you, which is housing. So how can we shape the provisioning of housing um, in a climate friendly way? And before we start the discussion, I would like to introduce now the three panelists to you. Iris Frey is uh, an ecological economist and she works as a campaigner for Attack, so one of the um, organizations who edited the book. And since many years she has been engaged in climate activism and that's also this perspective she's going to bring in today at this panel. Then we have Mario Tashwa. He's a political scientist and an economist, and he currently works at the University um, of Vienna um, on the role of unions and social policies, and he's also a board member of ATTAC. And uh, finally, we have Katharina Litschauer, also a political scientist and economist here with us. She works currently at the Vienna University of Economics and Business, and her main research interests include housing studies, critical urban studies, political economy, and she's especially interested in processes of financialization and social inequality. So welcome today to you. And the discussion is going to be organized in the following way. We will have first two rounds at the panel, and then I'm going to open the floor for your questions. You can already think about your questions and your comments you want to discuss with the panelists. Um, and I also invite participants um, of the online channel to put their questions into the chat. So please feel free to do so. I'm going to start now with um, Iris. And in this first round, um, I want to focus on the problems we encountered today when we think of a just and emission-free society. So what, according to you, um, what role did the activism play within this emerging climate policies and politics in Austria. Yeah, hello, good afternoon. Thanks for having me. Um, nice to see you all. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, climate activism, how it uh, contributed to the current uh, state of climate politics in Austria. Um, so to answer these questions, I think I have to uh, go a bit further. Uh, so. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the state of climate politics in Austria is not so well. So um, if you compare it to other EU countries, uh, Austria is not, not a, a good candidate, not a good example. So while the emissions in uh, the whole EU uh, decreased from 1990 to, uh, to 2017 by uh, one-fourth, the emissions here in Austria increased uh, by 5%. So actually, even though there is a, a lot of good environmental policies uh, to keep the air clean, to keep the water clean, um, also to keep the landscape mainly intact, um, there is not a lot of strong climate politics uh, that decrease emissions. Um, so actually, Austria has failed all its climate goals since 1990. Um, also, the last um, climate law where they wanted to decrease emis emissions uh, was failed and it ended in 2020. So now we have, uh, we have the status that there is no climate goal that's valid. Um, but uh, of course, on other levels, the EU uh, um, decrease, uh, increases its pace. So uh, the Fit for 55 program uh, prescribes um, a major emission reduction for all EU countries. 
as uh, with this Fit for 55 program, Austria would need to reduce um, its emissions by 48% in comparison to 25. But so far, we have not seen a lot of progress. And also, um, the institution which um, basically monitors the success of Austria within Austria, the Rechnungshof, it has already announced that Austria, with its current um, measures, will miss this goal again. Um, yes, according to the new government program from uh, the Green Conservative Coalition, Austria wants to become climate neutral until 2040, but so far there is no uh, climate law that would put this into um, laws and uh, give it a bi binding context. Um, so one reason for this is also that the first climate ministry ever in Austria was founded in 2020 when the Green-Black um, uh, coalition came into power. And um, in this climate ministry, ministry, there is now for the first time a bundle con uh, competences to also um, put into practice leg leg legislation um, to tackle climate change. Um, and this uh, was actually mainly achieved by the climate movement, by the Fridays for Future demonstration, who have mobilized a huge, um, a huge part of the population and have basically also achieved that the, the votes of the Greens turned out so that they could become a coalition partner for the first time in Austrian history. Um, yeah, so why are the climate politics so weak in Austria? Uh, there are three reasons for this. First, um, there is federalismus, so uh, the, the shared uh, competences and shared responsibilities on different levels. So on the federal state level, there are some competences, then there are some competences on the state level and some on the municipality level. Um, and this leads then uh, to, um, yeah, basically that, that projects c cannot go forward because these levels do not work together very well, because there are also different uh, parties and interests in power on these different levels. Um, so, for example, in the housing area, uh, it would be the responsibility mainly by the municipalities. Um, but then, like, if the state uh, prescribes high standards for insulation, for example, uh, then there is resistance from the municipalities. And when the state um, tries to uh, put incentives and tries, tries to help uh, financial-wise, uh, then the municipalities themselves decrease their own efforts. Or in the area of mobility, um, there is the problem that on all levels there is this um, this signals that we need to reduce uh, emissions in the mobility sector because this is also the main pollution area of Austria and where emissions are still increasing a lot. But then uh, the federal level is still financing highways and uh, car infrastructure um, and also on the municipality level there's uh, mainly a car-centered uh, city planning. Um, yeah, so the second reason is the strong presence of uh, interest groups uh, and also the social partnership. So there is, on the one hand, uh, the, the unions um, and the federation of unions, UGB, and on the other hand, uh, the, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, also the Industri Industriellen Vereinigung, in, um, yeah, uh, Industrial... Federation, Federation of Industry, um, the Chamber of Labor, and all of these actors, even though uh, one belong more to the Social Democrats and one more to, to the Conservatives or are aligned with them, um, they are often uh, pioneering for the same policies or like blocking the same policies in uh, the area of uh, climate policies because they argue that um, if you put into practice these policies, then Austria would lose competitiveness and uh, uh, in the end would lose also um, workplaces. And uh, in so, so um, these different interest groups, they come together in blocking uh, strong and brave policies. Um, uh, yeah, so, 
So that's a huge problem because they have um, a high formal power. They are uh, involved in um, policy making, but they also have high informal power uh, in um, t transmitting knowledge and building public opinion also uh, in the ministries. So um, this is a, um, a huge challenge uh, that they uh, these interest groups pose on, on climate politics. And also, um, after all, there's still the Conservative Party in power, and we see that they are lacking will and uh, lacking motivation to put uh, strong uh, climate policies into place. Um, yeah, and the ÖVP has, uh, after all, been uh, in, uh, uh, in the government uh, for a long time, and uh, we have not seen um, like strong actions from them to uh, really fight climate change. Yes. So thank you, Iris, for those first three important barriers why climate politics does not work as we want it to. <laughs> Mario, um, you are now the next. Um, now we come to the field, uh, social inequality, or as we put it into the title, um, what about the rich people? So how does... Um, social inequality, according to you, hinder effective climate social politics? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, first of all, I'd rather talk about, uh, rather name it wealth concentration or excessive wealth, because to me, social inequality always sounds like some people own a little bit more, others own a little bit less, but it's not a real problem. But we know it is a huge problem and the inequality in Austria, but also across the world, across the nations, uh, yeah, is, is astonishing. And to put, put you into the right mindset, what I have in mind um, when talking about the scandalous wealth concentration is three rich white men flying into space, like on their private business interest or for fun, um, Jeff Bezos and the other two guys, uh, Elon Musk, who, who wants, who, who buys Twitter uh, just for fun. So they fly into space, emit high emissions, high carbon emissions, while um, the rest of the population um, is suffering, or especially the global south is suffering um, from those emissions, from climate change, from droughts, and, and everything that is going to come. So this is uh, the, disparis uh, the disparity we're looking at. I would say there are two uh, main mechanisms how the wealth uh, concentration hinders effective climate policies. One thing is that Iris mentioned a little bit, is, or Iris mentioned is, is the, um, the political side, the political power of rich people, um, of um, how, how they can lobby, how they can influence politics. But I also, uh, we focused in our chapter on the economic power. Our chapter is called um, Inequality, Why We Can No Longer Afford the Rich. And we say the economic power stems mainly from the property relations that we have in the economic system. Because to simplify it for now, I see the uh, society based on two groups. There's one group of people that owns a lot of wealth that owns companies, owns financial assets, and the other group of people has to work, has to go to work every day. And they have to work for those people who own um, property, who own, if you will, means of production, or whatever you want to call it, who own the companies. Um, and this relationship is based, or this it is in the laws, and this is like the main, one of the main, um, or the main, um, pillar the economic system rests upon. So this is where I think econ economic power comes from. And to give you one very, it's a very um, clear example. It's a very, yeah, I've broken it down. It's a very simplified example, but it, as Christina mentioned in the beginning, it's about uh, Emma N. Steyer. So in Upper Austria, there's this production site. Um, which belonged to um, MAN, um, which is owned by Porsche Piech, the family of Porsche Piech, uh, who own the Volkswagen company. They're the most 
uh, the richest people in Austria and also in, in one of the richest um, families in Germany. So if it comes down or to make a drastic point, one family can decide over who produces what and what happens to the people who work in the factory and also what gets produced. And in this case, it was um, trucks with fossil fuel um, um, technologies. And we know this is a technology that we need to get rid of. And what happened last uh, in 2020, they said, okay, profits are not high enough anymore. They never had a deficit, but we need to go, or we want to go somewhere else, have a factory where the wages are lower. The, the political parties were not really visionary. They said, okay, let's uh, look for another investor. Hopefully someone will buy up this factory. And this is also what then happened in the end. Uh, Siegfried Wolf, uh, he has very good connection to Chancellor Sebastian Kurz and also to Russia and Putin. Um, yeah, acquaintances you rather not have at the moment. And he bought the plant. Of course, the workers were not very happy about it. And the employees, they had a vote and said, no, we're gonna, not going to comply with that. But in the end, they couldn't resist or they couldn't um, yeah, stop that taking over of the plant. And they had to, um, the, so the, the th situation was that their um, salaries were lowered, some people were fired, and um, so the situation worsened for them. And this is although the company Volkswagen said, okay, there, we have a social contract with you, we're going to produce in Steyr for 10 years, but then they just said, um, okay, we're going to go somewhere else. So the lesson I draw from that is we, social society, workers, employees, should never um, rely upon the 1%, the capitalist class, because they are going to do whatever they want. And also the problem is that if they decide to um, fire people, they're going to do it anyways. And if they want to produce or yeah, if they produce uh, technologies that are bad for the environment, for the climate, they're also going to do it. So that's... Uh, from the economic side, what, what hinders um, effective climate politics. Thank you for pointing out those points uh, of wealth concentration and also giving us this concrete example. Um, and Katharina, you are now going to have another concrete example, which is uh, housing, like one of the provisioning sectors we are tackling also in the book that we also speak about food provisioning, about mobility, Iris has mentioned it. Uh, that's also uh, like a different problem perspective. But coming back to housing, what, according to you, are the main challenges in the housing sector for climate social politics? Uh, thanks. Um, when we talk about the challenges, I think the first question to answer is, what is the task? What do we have to change when it comes to housing? And obviously, um, we have to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions uh, from the building stock, from the housing stock in Austria to basically zero. So we have to decarbonize uh, the housing stock. And that means, first of all, the reduction of energy use for heating um, um, and, and thereby to increase energy efficiency uh, of, of buildings. Um, but it also means um, switching to renewable energy sources when it comes to housing. But I think it's not just this sort of technical question of the building stock. Um, I think the, uh, the task ahead is also to reduce existing uh, inequality, inequalities in housing conditions. So to provide high quality, energy efficient, socially inclusive and still affordable housing to everyone. Um, so I think the task is this twofold, um, is, is this twofold task. Um, and out of this task, uh, I think we can name the challenges. Um, because within this um, inequalities of housing conditions, any measures, any political interventions will take place. And they will either increase inequalities or reduce them. And I think the aim should always be to not just sort of save the planet, but also reduce existing inequalities. Um, 
And housing is highly complex and it shapes our lives uh, on an ev everyday basis. Where we live, how we live, uh, shapes our access to schools, to uh, tr public transport. It shapes our health. Um, so it is highly important. Um, and housing inequality, therefore, um, has three dimensions, I'd say. The first is to build structure, the, so the materiality of housing, the, the real housing quality uh, that depends on the year of construction, the location of the building and so on. But housing conditions also uh, articulation or a reflection of uh, underlying inequalities in society at large. Um, when we heard from Mario about wealth inequality, I think this becomes obvious. So uh, about half of the population in Austria lives in owner-occupied housing, so they own their flats um, and houses. The other half has to rent, um, partly um, in private rentals, so faces insecure housing conditions, just because they are not as rich as others. Um, and this also leads to the third dimension of housing inequalities, which is housing itself creates um, inequalities. When we think about the fact that some people um, can't afford their rent, while others use those rent payments to buy their fourth, fifth, sixth flat uh, to rent, we see that housing itself contributes to this wealth uh, inequality. Um, so we have to take those things into account um, and this should be our starting point when we talk about challenges because what becomes obvious is it is a technical question of how do we change the housing stock, how do we build housing in a climate-friendly way, but it, it is also a, quite a social question of who decides what we do, who pays for what we do and who profits from what we do. And by taking these inequalities into consideration, I think uh, we are able to develop measures that uh, help us to both um, be climate friendly, but also reduce social inequality. And I think if for new constructions, it's rather easy because the main political instrument is is building standards and it is a political question of how to change it. You don't interfere in existing, uh, in an existing built structure. You don't interfere with the uh, with actual, actual housing units where people live. Um, what is the challenge is refurbishments of the existing housing stock. Um, it's first of all a complex technical question because as I said, housing differs. So the built structure differs. Not every energy source can be used everywhere. Um, um, insulation has to differ depending on, on sort of the concrete materiality of this housing. But it is also a social question because it depends on who lives there, who owns it. And I want to highlight two specific challenges when it comes to uh, refurbishments. First, I think, um, the, the, the problem is uh, that, ma that, that a lot of measures are not mandatory, but the decision is left to the private owner of a house. So private ownership rights uh, give people the power to place their individual interests about, above the collective interests of climate protection. Uh, so from a democratic point of view, I think it, it, it is important to stress not just rights that come with ownership, but also obligations and social responsibilities for, cl for climate, for our society at large. And this um, is even more so in private rental housing, where uh, the tenants, the people actually living in this housing, don't get a say whatsoever when it comes to refurbishment measures. Um, and we have to, um, admit that there's a con conflict of interest between tenants who aim for high housing quality um, and, and low housing costs and a lot of owners that aim for a, a high profit. 
uh, we, we can't ignore this conflict and eventually we will have to take sides. Um, so the challenge is to achieve democratic decisions where all people that are affected actually get a say. And the second is refurbishments involve a lot or high investment costs. Um, and this is not entirely compensated by lower energy costs, for example. So the big challenge is, or the question is, who should bear these costs? Um, and I think in light of wealth inequality, um, I think uh, we are able uh, to answer this question. Uh, we see that the challenge is therefore uh, to achieve not just energy efficient housing buildings, but to achieve a fairer and more equal distribution of existing resources through the implementation of uh, refurbishment measures. So it's, I think it's not, uh, it's not uh, difficult to see that the decarbonization of the housing stock and the reduction of social inequalities go in hand in hand. We can't achieve the one without the other. Thank you, Katharina, for this concrete example. And I think what all of you now refer to in this first panel round is the decision-making power one has or one does not have, or a certain group has, uh, and the social interest group has or does not have, kind of. Um, and also the question of res responsibility, right? That comes along with wealth, ownership, as you were mentioning. Um, or if you're organized in a lobbying group, um, as Iris was mentioning, for example. So thank you for this first round. And before I give you then the opportunity to ask your questions or give your comments, you can already think about it. Um, I want to do now another round. Uh, we've heard now several challenges from your different fields, which we also have seen are interconnected. Um, and now the second round uh, we're going to have is going to address um, to, to ask a question how we can address these challenges. Katharina, you were al already referring to building standards as one important measure, also having its problems, but a concrete measure that you gave us. Um, and I'm sure that there are other measures uh, we can tackle now and discuss, um, which are useful if we want to achieve a climate just society. So Iris, I'm going again to start with you, and I um, want to ask you what the current strategies are in climate activism, in uh, the climate movement, um, to contribute to this climate social society we want to achieve. Mm, thank you, Christina. Yeah, when looking at the climate movement, um, there are different actors and, and groups present. So um, we can basically differentiate between three different um, approaches maybe. So there's first um, the classic NGOs, environmental NGOs like Greenpeace, WWF, um, uh, Friends of the Earth, and they are mainly going for uh, concrete um, goals that are achievable, um, like they are doing campaigns on plastic uh, recycling or also pesticide reduction. And oftentimes it's maybe not so much linked with the social um, or not so much in a really explicit way. Um, um, then there is um, more movement-based or movement-oriented actors uh, that are mainly consist of groups uh, that are um, uh, uh, carried by, by volunteers. So uh, System Change and Climate Change, Fridays for Future, Extinction Rebellion, and I think with uh, system change and climate change, it was the first time that this uh, critique of capitalism and uh, the call and the demand for social ecological transformation was positioned in the discourse. So when system change and climate change was uh, founded, they really made strong this demand for social ecological transformation of the economy and um, connecting the social with um, the, the environment. Mm. So uh, they are going more for, for other strategies. They would uh, try to mobilize a lot of people. Um, they would try to um, also politicize people by also having their structures in a way that allows participation. So many of those groups, they have uh, basic democratic structures 
so that activists can uh, decide together what to do, which direction to take. Um, and they would also uh, try to organize these big demonstration manifestations uh, to bring topics on the public agenda. And I think it was really successful with um, Fridays for Future uh, that they brought uh, the climate on the public agenda. Um, now you see that uh, this is uh, crystallizing a lot in the uh, Lub uh, Lubau protests. So the fight against uh, the uh, Lubau tunnel that was, was to be built uh, under this natural reserve. Um, and uh, the movement has actually achieved to stop it. Uh, still, there's now this uh, road uh, to connect to this uh, tunnel that is still going forward and the city of Vienna wants to build it. And you see here uh, again these differences between the different levels. So uh, the mayor of Vienna and the social democrats, they want to go forward with it because they say that this is important for the people to drive their car, to go to work with their car. Um, and uh, the, the federal state level, they basically canceled this highway project. Um, yeah, so uh, the traditional um, or like the, the older traditional NGOs, they would maybe not go so much for these huge uh, street protests, but they would rather go for um, petitions, maybe doing photo actions, uh, doing lobbying, lobbying talks with politicians. And I think that's a uh, that's a main difference between them. And then there are also smaller projects that aim to live uh, the alternatives uh, that are envisioned by uh, the climate movement and the movement for social ecological transformation, and already put uh, these ideas into practice. So there are, for example, housing projects or eco villages, urban gardens, um, transition towns, and so on. And these projects, they serve also as a space uh, to calm down for activists, to also retreat, uh, to work on um, the groups and the internal dynamics and so on. So I think all of these different players, they um, act together uh, in, creating, um, um, yeah, in creating public pressure to put um, um, demands into practice. And I think uh, we see now that... Um, that the the the, Lubau, uh, the the fight against the Lubau uh, tunnel Lubau bleibt is a strong crystallization point where all these groups come together work together and also uh, what is important that there emerged over time networks that uh, provide the space to coordinate between those actors so for example klima protest is a network uh, with over 100 groups and organizations that work on the climate and they have the space there to develop demands, but also to organize the big climate strikes um, in autumn together. And you see that this is really effective because um, in this shared space, the actors can really mobilize together and uh, they are able to draw a lot more people and to bring a lot more people on the streets than uh, singular actors. So thank you, Iris, for um, showing us that mosaic of strategies that exist within um, climate activism and uh, pointing out to the important example of Lobau you're all familiar with uh, by now. Uh, Mario, how could social inequality, or you call it wealth concentration, <laughs> uh, how can it be addressed, how should it be addressed um, if we want to come closer to a climate social society? Yeah, first of all, I think it's <laughs> to me it's so clear we should not let the rich get away with what they're doing at the moment, with putting emissions into the air without accountability. This is not democratic and not fair. So in, in the book we have three, con well, two concrete proposals and the third is more a uh, discussion point, but uh, we really need to get in this direction. So first we need wealth taxation, uh, progress, progressive wealth taxation if we really want to tackle social inequality or wealth excessive wealth. We need wealth caps, so a limits uh, to wealth, how much an individual can own. And the third is the democratization of the economy to, um, democ yeah, to, to democratize um, the economic uh, system. 
First, um, I'm also a member of ATTAC, and um, when the co corona crisis hit last year, we thought, okay, it's going to go as in the last crisis, the mas vast majority of people will have to pay for the crisis again. So we set out um, to, um, yeah, we had a demand called Corona Lastenausgleich, so Corona uh, um, Burden Equalization, because we were thinking the rich are not contributing the fair share to society. And so we think, um, so we established being rich as owning more than 5 million euros net, so without debt. Is there anyone in the audience that owns more than 5 million euros uh, net worth? Financial assets, housing assets, uh, I don't know, yachts or anything? Not yet, come to me afterwards. It's a re really rare species, those uh, those people. It's 10,000 people in, in, about 10,000 people in Austria, we calculated. So we think those people should contribute, and if you own more than that, you should contribute 10%. It, it's a one-time um, payment, one-time contribution, and if you own more than 1 billion euros, everything that is over 1 billion, you should uh, contribute 60% of that um, to society, to state to society and all in all it would uh, we would have 80 to 90 billions of Europe and uh, 90 billions of euros and we can finance um, all the housing project all of that um, and so much more and um, for everything um, the corona crisis um, yeah, we had to uh, for all the people the heroes that got we clapped for we could um, make their lives better as well and yeah, after that, we need limits to wealth. So I think billionaires should not exist. It should not be able that a person owns more than a billion euros, which is also, it's very kind of thing because um, if you own 999 million euros, you're still very rich. So we should have a discussion about how much wealth uh, a person should be able to have. And the third one is the democratic control of economic processes. And um, this, when I come back to, to the example of Steyr, there are and there were alternatives on how people and the uh, workers, employees, and the unions could have gone forward. There are things like worker co-ops, um, co so factories that are owned by the workers and the employees. The state could have made guarantees or the state could have um, um, yeah, gotten a share of, of, the, of the company and this is would also change the 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 property relations, and the thing is, of course, this this will not maybe automatically change or the production to a greener system. But I think we should, um, or if the production then would be centered around the questions, what do we need for our region in Upper Austria or in Austria, or what can we produce in that uh, plant that would be useful to society. And if the people that work there, if the people from the region, uh, politicians, unions would be in a democratic council to discuss about that, what was needed in the in the region, then we would definitely have uh, other outcomes than we are getting now. And we know that in Steyr, electric buses could be produced, for example, for all of Austria or, um, yeah, and the, the state of Austria could um, buy electric buses or uh, trucks that we need in all of Austria and that would be uh, a viable possible solution. Thank you for um, giving us this picture and vision of a needs-based democratic economic system um, that you were pointing out. Now coming to housing, um, you already mentioned the building standards. I mean, there's loads of them, I suppose, <laughs> but uh, what other concrete measures um, should we take into account when we want to achieve climate social politics in housing? Um, yeah, I, I mean, obviously, housing is complex. Um, all, all, a lot of things that you already mentioned with, you know, the scattering of, of competences across the different federal levels and so on. All this applies to housing as well. Um, so before suggesting a few measures measures what i want to do is start at uh, starting from the aim of 
decarbonization of the housing stock and the reduction of social inequalities, I think um, it, it, it's useful to state a few principles um, that a housing policy or a climate social housing policy should be based on. And I think the, the most important principle is that housing is a right and not a commodity. Um, so housing should be acknowledged as a basic human need um, and therefore withdrawn from the profit logic of the market. Um, to provide um, housing, um, high quality and affordable housing for everybody, um, not depending on their ability to pay for this housing. Um, why do I think that? Um, it, this, would, this approach strengthens um, the right of use uh, against the right of ownership. Uh, so it strength, strengthens what housing should be for, namely housing ourselves. Um, and I think it's also important uh, to promote collective forms of ownership. Um, and this is um, especially uh, to counter the individual appropriation uh, of profits from the housing needs that we all have. Um, so... Um, and then we have to, when we come to concrete measures, when we agree on those principles, and I know that they are highly um, uh, contested, um, but if we agree on that, then, then we can start drawing out a few measures um, that take into account the existing social inequalities, take into account the existing wealth inequality and income inequality, and also uh, the inequalities in housing qualities, in housing conditions of people. Um, so we have to develop measures for owner-occupied housing, for private rental, and so on, because under each there are different social relations um, and not every measure kind of works for the same housing segment. Um, and so for each segment, we have to basically answer the two questions outlined before, the economic question of investment costs and the democratic question of decision-making power. And I think that that's something that comes up again and again in, in all the different political fields. I think a good starting point is limited profit housing in Austria um, because it is an, a well-established uh, and important pil pillar uh, of housing policy in Austria. Um, it allows high quality and affordable housing uh, for quite a, a lot of people um, um, and social housing in, in Austria and especially in Vienna has a long tradition. Why do I think it, it, it's a good starting point? Um, there, there are cost covering rents. So rents cover only the endured costs um, and not a profit on top. Um, there are limits on profits and any profits that occur because you, know, you can't calculate it that well and so on has to be reinvested into housing, which guarantees an ongoing production of social housing. And I think that limited profit housing is important because first of all, it shows what it means to orient housing towards um, the satisfaction of needs rather than uh, gaining profits. Um, for example, a, a maintenance and improvement contribution uh, in limited profit housing allows to build up reserves for necessary refor refurbishments over the life circle of the housing. So you have a distribution over generations of tenants um, and not just sort of the unlucky ones that live in a housing, in a, in housing where, where it has to be renovated. Um, and another point is co-ops, which some limited profit housing association or co-ops, they secure collective ownership. They partly enable tenants' participation and therefore answer the question of democratic decision-making power. Um, and we, if we take those aspects, um, I think we have to think about how, we, how do we do it in owner-occupied housing and how do we do it in private rental, because there it's, it's, it's way more difficult. Um, not everybody who owns a house is rich and wealthy. Not everybody can afford it. 
but eventually I think as society we have to interfere with those existing property rights and eventually we have to end up at emphasizing obligations and, and social responsibilities and make refurbishments uh, compulsory, stipulate energy efficiencies as requirements, ban certain energy sources, um, but we have to take existing social inequalities into consideration, therefore co have in addition uh, subsidies, state loans, grants and so on for the people that can't afford it. And I think wealth taxation will be a perfect way uh, to, to, uh, to, to finance subsidies. Um, yeah, and, and also I think it's um, other options would be to, um, to tie subsidies to a sales ban so that you, know, you can't speculate with a higher housing quality. Um, um, yeah, th 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 so that are just a few uh, examples that we could do already now. Um, but I think, and that's my last sentence, um, in, in private rental, I think it, to, in addition to all of that, we have to make tenants' rights and their, and their use rights more important. And we shouldn't stop there, I think. I mean, you talked about uh, alternative housing projects, and I think uh, they show in sort of their space how a different future how a different way of how we as a society provide housing for everybody could look like that distributes resources fairly, uh, both housing and wealth, and that uh, it takes into consider consideration climate protection as a, as a top priority. Thank you, Katharina. Uh, and I'm sure you could get more questions uh, on, on your concrete measures, maybe from now the audience. I'll open the floor for you finally. So are there any more questions you have for our panelists? We've heard now um, that there are different concrete strategies of how to build alternatives on the ground or how to... Um, yeah, focus on resistance or what the state should do if we want to achieve climate social politics. Um, but now I want to finally give you the floor for your questions and comments. And maybe also if there are questions and comments from the chat, we also um, are happy to take them here. If there are more questions we can collect, otherwise we go question by question. So please raise your hand, make yourself visible. It's a bit dark here. <laughs> from our side. Okay, one question. Hi, um, <clears throat> one question to you. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask, you just mentioned that um, when somebody's buying a building, he's not allowed to make, or he, he, he's not supposed to um, earn profit out of the sale of the housing and some other point, right? And what about like normal inflation and stuff? Like for example, when you buy a house today for 200,000 euros and in you want to sell it in 15 years and it's still 200,000 euros, it's nonsense, you know, nobody wants to buy it. So. <laughs> okay, thank you for this first question. Do we have other questions in the room? I see there are second hand. Hello, if I understand correctly, I mean, uh, the policy is that um, you take the money from the rich guy and use the money to to help the poor guy who can't afford the housing. But I think um, why the rich people we willing to to give their money? And I mean, it's a it's a difficult, so I want to know how to do it and how to achieve the goal. Thank you. Thank you for this important question. Maybe we can take a third one before we go back to the panel. If you have a third question or a comment. I think leading up to what you just said, um, about the rich people, um, wh what about the problem that the rich people might just go away 
um, and, and put your money in some Bahama island or wherever, um, or leave the country if, if, if we charge more taxes as a, as a society. Okay, and now since there was one hand raised, so that's the final question we take and then I'll give it back to you. Um, also, having my focus on this kind of rich people and rich family kind of thing, like a uh, company like Volkswagen is probably paying a lot of tax in Austria in a country like this. Um, there is like this GDP which they which they put a lot higher. And um, exactly what I wanted to add to this question: If Volkswagen is um, they they make their money out of out of out of cars, they pay a lot of taxes for producing cars in Austria. If we put higher taxes on uh, them producing cars in Austria, would it not be clever for Volkswagen to produce those cars in China or in a country where maybe they don't have to put pay that much tax? Where they are not that limited, what they do, what they what already they do yet, <laughs> so what they actually are doing right now. Okay, thank you for your uh, interesting questions. Um, we have one very concrete on inflation. Then a couple uh, of questions regarding this question of how to make the rich poorer, <laughs> how to make them pay, for example, taxes if they're being introduced. Um, how do you deal with it that they're not leaving the country, that they're not um, outsourcing production to other countries, continents, or as China? And um, I see the first question is like directly asks you, Katharina, the second more towards like Mario. And then I want to um, add or to, to also ask you, Iris, if there's also any strategy within the climate activist movement that refers to this question of rich people and how, how to address them um, and also how to address them in in your strategies that you were po pointing out earlier. Um, what arguments do you use maybe to convince people that they don't say they're not, they're anyways going to leave and that's for nothing if you want to introduce that measure. But let's start with you, Katharina. Yeah, the answer is really quick. quick. I mean, there are it's it's not a new policy instrument instrument to have have resale bans and no like normal uh, price appreciations are absolutely fine. The thing is that prices, if they increase more than I don't know this and that percent, let let's say two a year or ten in in that t time span, um, then you don't you can't resale it. So the thing is really to it's not to. It's it's actually not really a, a revolutionary demand. It just sa says don't speculate with the thing that everybody needs. Don't make an extra profit out of it. You do get enough money. Um, and to kind of take up uh, this thing of of moving because this is actually I think where housing comes into place. Housing is spatially fixed. It exists on a real spot and one unique spot on this earth. If people want to leave, um, I think we should, we as a society, and we have also not really revolutionary uh, demands uh, when we think about social housing and the fact that municipalities own social housing. I think we know what we do with those houses, and I think we know how we use them without a profit logic, but how we use them to satisfy human needs. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I was going to say that because with our Corona Lastenausgleich, we had the calculation, for example, with Verene Benko, one of the richest uh, guys in Austria. He had about 4.6 billion euros. And after our model, he still had two more than 2 billion euros left. So after all, I've, then I found it's not really that radical. But um, it's uh, connected to you because he could, what is he going to do? How is he going to pay that? He could give the the um, houses or the assets that he um, owns to the state or to society in a more uh, not um, in between manner, not directly to to the state, but maybe to other democratic institutions like cooperatives. Um, yeah, this is also, of course, they're not gonna give it 
to us as a for free because um, that's the main interest to make more profit. So we will have to build movements, which maybe uh, Ries is going to touch upon. We always, but no matter what we achieve as labor movements, as climate movements, um, working less, that was always a demand, that was always a fight. Um, so no one's going to give us anything for free, especially the 1%, the capitalist class, or so on. And uh, concerning your point, I see it's a very powerful nar narrative, the capital flight and like how wh what they do, uh, paying taxes and stuff. What I want to try to show you with my example of Emma and Steyer is that they're going to do it anyways. They, Austria didn't do anything. There were no taxes introduced, nothing. They sa just said, we want more profits. Wages are lower somewhere else. We're going to go. So I think that this is also kind of a threat that they are using. And we should get uh, start thinking in another way, thinking, okay, this is we should not let this happen to us. And if they're going to somewhere else, if they hold um, yeah, um, buildings, assets, they're not going to do it, or we're going to use it. Or if it's a company, okay, let the workers take it over. Let the communities take it over and produce whatever we need. So we need to establish uh, alternatives to that. Uh, like, you know, in our thinking and that, but also getting it through unions, becoming more radical, it's old stories. It has been there, and we need to um, to start thinking like that again. Yeah, yeah and how to do it? Um, I mean, yeah, I think we often forget on which so shoulders we really stand, because not so long ago, maybe a lot of us wouldn't be able to sit here, but we, we would be actually forced to work in factories and not just 40 hours a week, but 60 hours or even 80 hours. And that this is not the norm anymore was because of people organized. They went on strikes. They basically put the owners under pressure and they said, okay, we will not continue with this until you give us what we demand. And I think oftentimes we forget this. Also, me as a woman, I can only vote because there were serious fights for women's uh, voting rights. There are still serious fights that we as women are not discriminated against and it's still, it, the fight is not over. So I think we also have to acknowledge that this is not like the, the climate crisis and the multiple crisis that we are in. This will not just go away if we talk about it. But we have to really also put effort and work into it, into organizing us, into really also blaming what's going wrong. And I think one central part of this is blaming the rich. And it's often, often not so visible, and oftentimes it's not talked enough, also in the climate movement, because they have the ability to hide. Um, they don't have to um, even register their money. They don't have to tell the state how much money they possess, how much wealth they have. But if you uh, earn Mindestsicherung or if you, are, if you ever applied for Mindestsicherung, you have basically to, for social security, you have to basically prove uh, uh, how much uh, money you have. You have to lay your accounts open and so on. So always the poor are more surveilled, more controlled than the rich because they, they have the ability to hide. But we see what they are doing. We see what Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are, are doing. They are wasting our climate and it's our earth and we need to live on it. And our kids need to live on it. So we should hold them accountable and we should fight for measures that they are taxed, that they are uh, hold accountable for what they, are, uh, what they are doing to our planet. Thanks for highlighting the importance of social struggles and the rights we gain through those different groups um, since centuries. Um, and I want to point out that the role of the vision is also one uh, we have been aware of when writing the book. Uh, so if you want to have a look at it later on, the first part of the introduction is a vision of a just and emission-free um, climate social or um, of climate social politics and it starts with this vision because exactly of this reason to get out of the usual thinking of what we cannot achieve or cannot do but open up our minds for something which is possible. So now we have a second round of possible questions um, or comments of course which are also very welcome. 
please raise your hand or I don't know if meanwhile we got questions also in the chat. No questions in the chat, but it's your chance to ask more questions. There is a maybe let's take um, the person first who has not spoken yet. Thanks. Um, thank you very much for this very interesting um, discussion because um, I'm very, uh, I was very curious because uh, coincidentally two weeks ago I was holding this book at Talia and I was like, well, this is going to be very important for my thesis. <laughs> so um, this is perfect. Um, and um, maybe I have a first comment and then a question. And the comment is that um, I feel very frustrated about everything, of course, that is going on. It's a multi-layer uh, issues uh, that it's even hard to close your eyes and say, okay, where do we start then? As professionals, as civils and everything else. Um, and at the same time, I see maybe um, as a strategy that I would like to know is literally not just about maybe the community mobilization, but how to start the action. Um, for example, then here comes my question, the, to democratize, democratize the economy. Um, I was also reading at the Christian Felber book about this, this afternoon, by the way. And how, how this uh, starts, for example, like, if I have my neighborhood and people are angry also, but it, it lacks information, I guess. So where to start, for example? Thanks. Thank you. Then there was another question um, from the person. Yeah. yeah, no, yeah, I think we have time. There's a third question. Then in the back. Hi, um, uh, I have more like, um, yeah, it's it's still a question, but more um, like Luftgedankenschloss um, uh, um, and so. Um, and uh, at the first um, Bundesregierungserklärung from uh, from Germany, um, there was uh, said that we need uh, 450,000 new flats uh, in the year 2022 um, in Germany built, and. Um, I don't know the answer to it. It's so uh, I just want to ask you guys if you have like some any sorts of ideas. How can 450,000 flats being built without the um, private sector? Um, uh, <laughs> you, you know what I'm heading at. Um, without the private sector investing, um, and well, of course, when the private sector is investing, it's going to come out to the profit at the end of the day, which is not good. I I agree. But um, I don't have like really the vision or the idea or the knowledge um, how uh, 450,000 uh, flats should be built in one year without private people in Germany or from other countries um, can invest and make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Then there was another question in the back. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask about the rich people. So my question would be, don't you think that uh, rich people are carrying much more risk than the normal people? For example, you said that uh, Elon Musk bought Twitter for about $4 billion just for fun. And let's say in one year Twitter goes bankrupt, it will be forbidden in most of the countries. It is possible, for example, I, I think Twitter is banned in China, is banned in Russia now, and let's say in one year, Twitter goes bankrupt. So does not uh, uh, Elon Musk carry much more risk that should be like highly rewardable? Thanks. Don't see any, well, there's one more question and then uh, j just um, maybe to broaden the discussion a little bit. Um, 
I, I really have the feeling now that it's uh, the, the rich people are the bad guys and the poor people are the good guys. But they're, they're really responsible rich people and they're irresponsible poor people. Um, shouldn't be the, that the, be the discussion. Um, so shouldn't be the discussion how we can make irresponsible people who do have the means to invest in, uh, in a fair society, how can we uh, motivate them to in include them, uh, to make them investing in socially, climate socially responsible housing and other yeah, responsible projects? W that would be much more rewarding than just taking the money and spending it, I think. Mm -hmm. If you give them <coughs> the opportunity to, to feel good uh, about what they do, this maybe make, makes them motivate to, because it, I mean, I agree with um, what has been said before, it requires uh, financial commitments to, to, to make something, to, uh, to build something more, um, yeah, to in, improve the, the housing. Uh. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We come back now to you. Um, I see there's like one very concrete question on how to get more housing um, and what does this mean for the private sector if we want to and need to have much more housing now with the example of Germany. Then there was the question of how to actually democratize the economy. Easy one, right? So I think this is one maybe to all of you or whoever wants to answer. Uh, the second one on the rich and poor people or to broaden the question on the responsibilities of people in general, but being aware of the different roles, I would still add, in the society they have, and also um, more precisely the question of risks that rich people carry. Who would like to start? So, Mario? I Please can start, because rich people has get so much attention. Of course, uh, um, the thing is, it's about the economic system. So it's a, a structural thing. And you can exchange the names of the rich people. At the moment, it's Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Maybe in 10 years, it's someone else. But it's always the system that creates those uh, excessive wealth uh, inequalities. So it's always the system, but there is rich people that have a lot of power, individuals and then maybe also take some risk. But to that, I would say, okay, he's a billionaire. He's got everything he wants. He can do everything he wants. What risk does he really have? If he, if he loses $40 billion, he still has, I don't know how much left, one, $200 billion or something. So I don't really see the risk. The risk, um, to, to, to get it into perspective, I think, people doing work in, in hospitals or, I don't know, um, everyone that was a hero in COVID, those are people carrying out risks. They, had, they were um, exposed to the risk of getting in, in, uh, infected. So, um, and those are people that are often working for rich people and making them even richer. This is the classical law of uh, um, uh, um, exploitation of Karl Marx. So they... Um, yeah, make profits for, for the rich. Let's keep it simple with that. So I don't really see how he's, Elon Musk or other people, uh, rich people are taking a, a huge risk because, yeah. So we always need to um, change the structure of the economic system and this is hard. Maybe someone else can pick up with how to start uh, organized, but. I think this, yeah. Is a question for you, Iris. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can also speak on this, but uh, also on this other point, like, shouldn't we change uh, the discourse? And it's not against, uh, it's not about the rich against the poor. Um, I wouldn't agree. It's really, uh, it's really about this. The rich, they pollute the climate, they destroy our earth, and the numbers are so clear. The richest one percent, they emit more than fifty percent of the global emissions, and this is like. Also, because in the global south, due to colonialism, the global north has extracted so much wealth so that we are now live in this um, yeah, seemingly egalitarian society where we have um, yeah, the privilege to live as we live. 
Um, but this is on the shoulders of other people in the Global South. And actually, even in the Global North, the richest 10%, they are the most polluting ones. And you say that they are irresponsible poor people? Yes, for sure. But still, the rich people, they have the uh, money to buy the big SUVs to fly uh, for a shopping weekend to Hawaii or to New York or wherever. Um, and they also do it. And of course, there are some that have a consciousness. Um, also, there are some millionaires that want to share their millions, want to um, start foundations, also to give some, some money for the poor and so on. But this is not... Um, the thing we want, because then they even have, they have through their money the power to decide where to give the money to. So the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they have a lot of money, but they give it to projects that then um, basically develop solutions that uh, feed the money back to them. So they would um, develop some, uh, maybe some medicines, some vac uh, vaccines, whatever, that then are sold by firms where they own shares so that they would then get some money back. So, for, so, so that's a problem then, that in this logic, um, the rich uh, still stay the ones who decide where to spend the money and they maximize their wealth through this means even. So if you look at um, what they are doing, where they are investing, um, you will see that this is not, okay, charity, we really share our wealth, we do some good for society, but in the main parts, this is um, like a strategy to then get more rich even. So I think we really should name this problem and we should tackle it. And this is by democratically agreeing on um, which areas in society we want uh, to finance with this money that is also not owned by themselves, but it's owned and earned by societal infrastructures, by um, the work of other people um, that are working in their companies. It is um, earned by uh, heritage. So um, nobody gets rich just by working hard, but only people get rich, uh, really rich, that uh, get heritage. So um, we as a society who contributed to this wealth building, we should also then decide what is being financed with it. And this could be some things like social housing or um, a good mobility system, a good health system, a good school system, so that everyone has the chances of also building up um, and growing in a society. This is one point. And on this, where to start? Um, I think we are now here to give you a perspective and a vision, but still, uh, this should not <laughs> pull you down and uh, dic anchor, uh, discourage you. Um, and I think like you can do anything, basically. What gives you pleasure? Where do you want to go? Where do you feel good? Do you want to talk to people about this? This is also very inspiring sometimes. You can organize in an association. You can organize in an NGO. You can even uh, join the Lubao Bleibt uh, <laughs> movement. Um, there are many small steps that one can do, even just Discussing in the family at, at dinner is a contribution. You can basically do everything as long as it's not um, making a decision in the supermarket because this will change nothing. I tell you, bluntly, honestly, this is nothing that you should pursue, this green consumption thing, um, because you can, in the supermarket, only choose between the product that includes child labor and the product where uh, the, uh, the rainforest is cut down. So basically you get only to, uh, to choose between the products that big corporations, companies are placing for you. And this will not make a dif difference. But you should really um, look, okay, where can I, I um, organize with people? Where can I t talk to people? Where can I build networks? I can um, spread ideas via social media. And there are so many good things out there. There are so many projects. So there's a huge possibility for you all to engage. Thank you, Iris, for this vision and very concrete uh, suggestions how to get active. Katharina, now it's time to you and to come back to the question on 455, I think it was, housing facilities that should be built now. Yeah, and how we can do it without private companies, right? That was the question. Um, I want to pick up where you left because I think it is... Um, if we if we have those you know 
concrete question of, of how do we do it. I think we should start uh, at the question of what would an alternative way of providing for people look like. That's why I started with the economic question of investment costs and the de political or democratic question of decision-making power. And why I emphasized um, that we should aim at collective solutions rather than individual solutions. Um, and, and those principles, I think, help us to kind of um, see through the forest <laughs> and, 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 and identify different elements, especially in a field like housing or new construction of housing, which is so complex. Because first of all, you need land. Uh, building plot prices are increasing tremendously. So uh, we need to figure out, as we as a society, need to figure out how, how, we, can pr how we can provide uh, affordable building plots. Then there's the question of financing. There's a lot of investment going into new constructions. Uh, capital is, is, so sh is, is, so to say, fixed for quite long periods of time um, in housing. And then, you know, only then starts, start the question of, of building activity, so the actual building of a new housing. Um, so we have to see all those aspects and all those policy fields and develop solutions um, that that you know that put forth uh, the fact that housing should be a right and not a commodity. And it de always depends on the institutional setup of you know not even a country but even a city. In Vienna, we have a long tradition of. Uh, land policies, um, you know, we have different zoning categories, 2018, a new zoning category was developed that helps to keep building plot prices down. In other cities, the situation is difficult uh, because they don't have those policy instruments. The same is with housing subsidies that enable, uh, for example, limited profit housing associations to finance um, their housing constructions. Um, so fi housing subsidies is another example where, you know, we should aim at, aim at object subsidies. So to subsidize new constructions rather than subsidize the fact that people can't afford their housing and basically hand over uh, our, our money as society uh, to landlords because this is what, uh, what what subject subsidies are. So in all those things, you know, it, it it, it comes down to the details, and that's why I think um, it, it is important to aim at collective solutions, to start at principles and aims, and then develop demands for both specific political instruments, but also demands that can be discussed with each and everyone in society and enable us to envision another way of providing housing, but also providing other services. Thank you, Katharina. Thank you also for this vision. And we have now still time for the last one or two questions from your side. Please raise your hand. Yeah. One next to you. Uh, so you. Yeah. Um, you you started the the discussion um, with um, um, by saying that the Austrians are not so well in uh, environmental uh, <laughs> uh, protection uh, because they don't uh, meet their their goals, and uh, so when I combine this uh, with the knowledge about the the richness of the country uh, and uh, the um, knowledge that rich people are polluting more. So it seems to be logic that the rich country, Austria, is polluting a lot. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's a question of education too. Or a question of, uh, I mean, do we have to educate rich people actually? Or rich countries more? Do we have to make them more aware of the problem because they are too rich uh, to be aware? of the problem. This is the first question. And the second is uh, you underlined the importance of uh, pilot projects. And I, 
I'm, I'm really not engaged in developing uh, pilot projects. And we uh, have always, uh, we're always uh, discussing with our funding agencies, how can we um, scale it up? <laughs> because uh, you need, so the, the uh, innovator uh, has, uh, has always uh, to invest much more, you know, uh, to, to push through the innovation for the first time. And uh, it, theoretically, it's much easier for the second one, but uh, it's kind of elite program too uh, to, to, to run these pilot projects uh, because it's much more difficult to, to include, uh, let's say, more poor people to these projects uh, because it, you need time, you need connection, you need, you know, especially in housing, you need a lot of time in these housing projects. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, because of time, I'll come back right to you now. So there's two questions. Do we have to educate the rich to get climate social in Austria? And what's the role of pilot projects and how could we upscale them? And uh, since it's the last round, uh, I ask you to be A, very short, and then B, also think about the very last take-home message you can put at the end uh, of your final statement. And um, Mario, let's start maybe with you. Yeah, educating the rich or like rich countries. Or I think in terms of, I always think about uh, a country in terms of people who are rich and, and middle classes and working classes. So educating the rich is not gonna do a lot. I think we will have to educate ourselves and working class people. Um, but not only formally, but in terms of, okay, how can we organize, where can we start to change things? That is also um, um, education for me. And also, I, I would start anywhere to organize. I would start in the workplace, the working work, uh, Workers' Council, Betriebsräte, um, or at your home, or, yeah, not, and I want to make advertisement for ATAC as well. You can always come to ATAC and, and try to change the world with us. Uh, but I know it's hard. And if, if we have um, the rich, are the rich people um, are tough enemies because they can hide, as we've heard, and they have the law on the side. So it's not an easy uh, and quick fight. But um, the history has shown that we, uh, if we keep fighting, uh, we can um, uh, con um, we can achieve a lot. And maybe someone else can pick up. Or in, if you look to Berlin, there's a huge housing movement going on at the moment. Deutsche Wohnen. Deutsche Wohnen and Eignen. So expropriation of companies is a thing that uh, people are talking about and 60% uh, of the B Berlin population has voted for the expropriation of companies, housing companies in Berlin. So change is possible. Thank you, Mario. Katharina. Thank you for pointing this out because it, I had not to take a note, but I forgot to say it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I also want to take up the question of education um, because I think when it comes to what, what do we have to do with our housing stock, I think, I mean, although it, it, it is really complex and there are dif difficult technical questions, um, I think it is pretty clear what we have to do. It's energy efficiency of, of housing and renewable energy sources. Uh, rather than fossil energy sources. Um, so the question is not so much about knowing what to do, but it's about getting people to do it. Um, and this is where the question of power comes into, into the picture. Um, and I think we should take education seriously. Uh, we should take education seriously in the sense that we should use education to cha change this existing relation of power to our strengthen our side. Um, and uh, yeah, to have not a deep, but have a discussion in society about whose interests are we protecting um, and how do we want to live in, in the future. And so we have to acknowledge, uh, first of all, existing 
relations of power and that there are in conflicts of interests and that there are sides and we have to answer for ourselves and sort of collectively where do we want to go from here and I envision a society uh, where we bear the costs according to how people can can contribute and uh, to so satisfy everybody's needs in this society. So to put forth people's needs and to um, and to and to provide for human needs in a collective way. Thank you, Katharina. Iris, your last words. <laughs> Yeah, um, um, education, education, education is important, uh, but as the others also said, um, if we are organizing a lectures for millionaires on how they pollute, will they show up? <laughs> I doubt that. So, um, I mean, all the information is out there and media has been reporting on climate crisis for um, like really intensively over the last uh, couple of years. Um, we also have the Paris Climate um, Goals. We have the uh, worldwide uh, climate conferences where these goals are negotiated. And also Global South countries are really holding Global North countries accountable and demanding for um, strong reduction targets. And um, in Austria, yeah, we see that, that like politics are just um, lacking the will. And that's... Um, related to what you said, right? So the Conservative Party, who consists mainly of rich people in power, they just have no interest because it would mean that they would lose profits. So I think also that the answer to this is um, really this organizing. So you need to get active, you need to organize, you have to um, also, of course, um, make this point that that this is the problem, this behavior um, of, of the rich people that they only care for profits and not for um, society. Um, but then like the solution I would really see in like that we as people, we also demand that our societies um, can get healthy and can flourish and that our environment also flourish and that we, we are put in a situation where we are able to care for the earth and not are basically also forced to go by car to destroy um, to destroy our environment um, and to build our cities in a not sustainable way. So I think organization, <laughs> organize, 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 and you can do it in many ways, as I said. So yeah, also listen to yourself, and I think it's it's out there. Thank you. There's like two concrete examples how you can organize. You can see them in the back. Uh, Annalena is sitting there. There is material from Attack has been mentioned as an organization, but also the Beigewurm. So if you got interested in the book, it's over there. You can get it today. We also have the Kurswechsel, uh, the journal that I mentioned at the beginning. Maybe you're interested in one of the most recent um, issues, which is on infrastructure, critical infrastructure. There's also one contribution on um, mobility. Um, of course, we have house, housing politics in there, but then also care infrastructures, for example. So if you're interested in that, then we have a form where you can sign up for a newsletter. Um, and um, I'm sure that there are many other examples where you could get active. Um, and you can also talk to the panelists here later on if you're still interested in that. But for now, I want to thank you for your attention now for this last 90 minutes, for your great questions. And I also want to thank the panelists and um, wish you a nice and a good evening. And I hope to see you at our next panel discussion of or on climate social politics. Thank you. Thank you.